Well, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us once again. Um, we are Grace Community Church. We are a local church with a global vision, and we are broadcasting live from Manchester. My name is Joseph. I'm honored to be the pastor here of Grace Community Outreach Center. Apologies that we're joining a little bit later than usual, uh, but we were just caught up in a bit of worship, which is very important. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at a very interesting topic for Palm Sunday, which I title The Power of True Worship. I just want to take some time to pray. Let's just talk to the Lord this morning. Father, we thank you for your word. The Bible said that the entrance of your word brings light. It brings understanding to the simple. Lord, I pray this morning you'll make my lips like the pen of a ready writer. And I pray, oh God, the Holy Spirit, you will speak to every heart in an individual way. Lord, make us, make it be, let it be that our hearts will be enlightened, encouraged, and challenged so that we will never remain the same. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. And let the church say amen. Amen, amen, amen. The power of true worship. The power of true worship. Hallelujah. I'm going to jump straight in, if that's okay with you. I'm going to jump straight in. We want to be honorable with our time today. Praise the Lord. And we've got a text to read. I'm going to share this with you. In the book of Luke chapter 19. And when he had said this, he went ahead going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass that when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you where you shall, where you as, where as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Lose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you losing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. Hallelujah. Verse 32. So those who were sent were dead. Those who were sent went their way and found it just as the Lord had said to them. But as they were loosing the cult, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosing the cult? Why are you losing the cult? And they said, the Lord had, has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus and they threw their own clothes on the cult. The men threw their own clothes on the cult and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the, on the road. And then as he was draw, now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. Verse 38, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said in verse 40, and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Hallelujah. Go with me to the book of John chapter 4, verse 20. John chapter 4 and verse 20. Bible says our fathers worshipped on this mountain and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Verse 21, Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. Verse 24, God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. This Palm Sunday, it behooves me to, to 
dwell on a certain aspect of Palm Sunday that is not perhaps touched on quite a lot. I have been threatening, in quotes, for a while to teach on worship or to speak about worship, and that day has finally has finally come. Uh, for anybody who knows me, anybody knows that worship is a subject that is really, really close to my heart. And humorously, I must say, I was tempted to preach about the donkey. The donkey was a very close second. Well, I decided not to talk about the donkey today. The donkey is a great subject. We can talk about the donkey. We can talk about uh, all how God can use anything for his purpose. There's a lot that we can, uh, a lot of exegesis and explanations and teachings that we can get from that passage of scripture. But I want us to focus on the idea of worship this morning. The Bible says the time is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship God in spirit and in truth. Now this morning, I, I, I want to quickly make a disclaimer that I, I want to uh, apologize to those of you who have been in church for a long time, because I want to really break this subject down to the nitty gritty. I, I don't want to assume that everybody has been in church for a long time. I, I want to take this to first principles, if that's okay. So I really want to take this down to the nitty gritty. What does worship mean? What does it mean to worship? The word worship, the one of the most popular words for worship used in the Hebrew is the word shakar. Hallelujah. The word shakar. It means to depress, to bow down, to fall down flat. It's a picture of humility. Hallelujah. To bow down, to depress, to fall down flat. Amen. It's a picture of humility before the Lord Yahweh, before the almighty God creator Yahweh. The English, the word itself is derived from old English, which means to venerate, to lift high, to honor an object or to give at its simplest definition, worth to something, to show something to be valuable. That's what it means to worship. So when we talk about worship in the church, we're talking about giving God the, his rightful place honoring God and making him valuable, telling God how, how great he is, giving him, like the psalmist said, the honor that is due his name. Is somebody hearing me? We're, we're, we're talking about venerating God. We're talking about lifting up the name of the Lord. We're talking about putting God where he needs to be. The Bible says, uh, uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. One translation says, in all your ways, put him first. That's what it means to worship. To put him first. <laughs> to put God first in everything that you do. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9, it says something there. That honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruit of all your offering. It means to give God your best. It means to give him your first and your best. That's the definition of worship. Worship is not just singing a song. Worship involves singing songs. But that's not what worship is all about. Worship is not just coming to church. It's good to come to church. You made it. You're right here. But that's not all worship is all about. Worship is about putting God first. In every decision that you and I make, making sure that it is God's agenda, God's idea, God's opinion that comes first. Hallelujah. That's what worship means. And I'm going to be coming back to that because sometimes people use this word worship or people think they're worshiping, but actually they're not. I want to, I want to enlighten us because uh, I remember growing up as a young believer and... Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Don't laugh at me, but you know, there were some there were some guys who used to intimidate us with some of these words. And there are about seven or eight words used interchangeably in the Bible, uh, which refers to different expressions of worship, different ways in which people can and do worship. And I just want to share some of them with you. One of the words used in the Bible, uh, used for, for worship, is a word called barak. To barak. Barak means to bow, to, to bless the Lord, to bow down or to kneel before the Lord. It communicates that the Lord holds a place 
of importance. And it helps us remember just how great he is. Barak is not something you're doing to beg God. No, no, no. This is more of an attitude of expectancy. This is a show of confidence in the greatness of God. When you kneel before God and you bow down and you say, God, I know you are great. You are baracking the Lord. You are showing how great the Lord is. Another nice word that people use a lot uh, that you, you may or may not have heard is, is something similar. Uh, it's a word called halal, halal, to halal the Lord, hallelujah. It means to celebrate. It means to rave about him. Uh, one translation says to be glamorously foolish, hallelujah. It means to shine, to boast, to show the greatness of God. It's used about 110 times in the Old Testament. It literally translates in to rave about the Lord, to celebrate can you imagine just a more wondrous noise about raving? Jeremiah says, anybody who wants to boast should boast, make their boast in the Lord. Hallelujah. And there are other, other words that are in your notes that the Bible uses. The, the, the word shabak, to, to shout loudly, to, to command. Uh, it's not just about love, but the focus is about making the name of the Lord great or making his name to be proclaimed loudly. Another word, which one of my favorites, because I used to be in the choir, uh, under the choir we used to call, that was called Tehillah. The word is Tehillah. Tehillah, Tehillah to means to sing praises, to sing out in the spirit, spontaneous praise. It means to sing in an unrehearsed manner, unplanned, unrehearsed, uncensored, just bursting out in praise, hallelujah, raising your, 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 your voice in thanksgiving, no, no, no script, just unrehearsed spontaneous praise, that's Tehillah. Another word that the Bible uses is the word Toda, it means to extend your hand in thanksgiving, Some, almost in, in worship, just extending your hands, raising them in thanksgiving. Another word that I like so much is the word Yada, Yada. Y-A-D-A-H. It means to extend your hand vigorously. One translation actually puts it to throw because of the, the motion goes like this. It's as if you're throwing something. But basically, it means to extend your hands in complete surrender. And last but not the least, number seven, is a word called zamar. To touch the strings, to make music. Hallelujah. To make music. To make music. The word zamar. So it's, you can see here that there's so many ways in which we can express the Lord. I remember growing up, and I'm not knocking anybody, but I remember growing up and there were people that told us, you know, you couldn't bring instruments into the church because they were the devil's instrument. Or, you know, you couldn't dance in a certain way. You know, you had to sway in a sanctimonious manner from time to time. This is not scriptural because, yeah, yeah, some of you are smiling and laughing, but you'll be amazed. They told us that drums were from the devil, you know. They, they said, you know, especially the electric drums, the nice ones that I like, you know, those ones that go to, to, you know. They said, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. You have to bring a nice piano and, you know, play it in a, in a sanctimonious way. But that's, that's not the impression the Bible gives us. If, if you look at all those different Hebrew words, the Bible talks about praising God wildly. Hallelujah. The Bible talks about stretching out your hands. The Bible talks about dancing in the presence of the Lord. The Bible talks about giving him a wild, spontaneous praise. The Bible talks about using stringed instruments. The Bible talks about, you know, playing your, your heart out to the Lord. And, 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 and I wonder where some of these guys got their own doctrine of scriptures from. So, so don't feel condemned about praising and worshiping God. Let's worship God. Of course, with decorum. Make sure that it's in tune. Hallelujah. <laughs> Just make sure that it's in tune. Okay, I'm pulling your legs now. Well, the Bible says we should worship the Lord anyhow. Hallelujah. Psalm 149 that we read in the Bible, on Friday night, the Bible says, let the high praises of God, that, you know, let, let me quote that scripture properly. Psalm 149, let's go there. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen, amen, amen. Psalm 149. I want to quote it properly. Amen. The Bible says, sing unto the Lord. Praise ye the Lord, Psalm 149. Sing unto the Lord a new song. His praise 
in the assembly of the faithful people. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the people of Zion be glad in their king. Let them praise his name with what? Dancing, come on now. And make music to him with timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with victory. Let the faithful people rejoice in his honor and sing for joy on their bed. Let the high praises of God be in their mouths and a double-edged sword be in their hand. So you see here, the scriptures tells us that we need to worship the Lord with dancing, with singing. I just thought to chip that in there uh, for some of us very religious and sanctimonious people. Hallelujah. Now, what does it mean to worship? What's the heart? What's the thrux of worship? What's the thrust? What's the, the, the basic reason behind worship? Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13. Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13. The Bible says there in the New International Version, the Lord says that these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. So God does not like, you see, I, I, I want to quickly point something out here that God can spot a fake. Is somebody hearing me? Yeah, yeah. God can spot a fake. You know, it's not about it's not about singing or making noise or dancing, all that, all those things. The Bible talks about that, 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 that when I read that scripture, there's a certain degree of, of disappointment in, in that scripture that I believe that the Lord is expressing here. You know, he's saying that these people these people come with their mouths. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So the truth of the matter is, that for, if you can extrapolate from this scripture, God wants our hearts. God does not just want your dancing. God does not just want your singing. God does not just even want your money. God wants your heart. God wants our heart. God wants my heart. Because not based on human rules that we have been taught, but you see, because you go into certain churches today and you know, there is, and there's nothing wrong with the liturgy and all of that. But when you're reading the prayers and you're reading the worship, it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't really come from the heart. There needs to be some spontaneity about worship that comes from the depths of your heart. There's something about worshiping God from the, from the crevices of your heart that is beyond just mere words or mere repetition or glib or nice words. God is not interested or impressed with nice words. Is somebody hearing me? I said that God has the ability to spot the fake. Look at Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13, Proverbs 28, 13. Let's look at a few of those scriptures. Amen. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13. Just showing about, you know, what the frustration that God has. The Bible says that in Habakkuk 1.13, that the eyes of the Lord are too pure to behold, to look upon evil. His eyes are too pure to behold evil. So God is not interested in, God can spot a fake from afar off. Proverbs 28.13, let's look at that scripture. Hallelujah. Proverbs 28, 13. The Bible says that if you if you if you cover your sins, Proverbs 28, 13. If if we conceal our sins, we will not prosper. But whoever confesses and renounces them will certainly find mercy. So God, you see, God is not God is not impressed with our display because you see, can I get into your business this morning? Many of us. Um, you, let me give a rough example. Let me use myself. Okay, let me be the scapegoat. When we were in school and we, we in the boys' hostel, you know, we 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 were in the tidiest of people, and and some people may argue that we are still not the tidiest of people today. But that's not the topic of the sermon. <laughs> but whenever we had a guest, especially a member of the opposite sex, some sister from the fellowship, Hallelujah. When sisters were coming to visit, 
you will see boys that never used to bother about anything. All of a sudden, they are cleaning up everywhere. Ha! They got the perfume out. They're dusting the pillows. They are changing the bed sheet. They are putting their best foot, their best fingers, their best head forward. They're putting, man, they clean everywhere. And when you come in, oh, your room is nice. And they smile and go, <laughs> yeah, praise the Lord. That's how we are in this place. No, no, brother. You, you, you put on a show <laughs> because you knew <laughs> that somebody was coming to visit. And so this is what God is saying that, look, don't put on a show. Don't try and pretend to be what you are not. God sees your heart. God knows you. As a matter of fact, <laughs> the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, that, look, the Lord knows those who are his. God knows you. Let's read that scripture, 2 Timothy 2, verse 19. I suspect I won't be able to finish today. Lord, help me. 2 Timothy 2, verse 19. The Bible says, Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands sure, sealed with this inscription, that the Lord knows those who are his. Let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Stop the pretense. If just come before God the way you are, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 says, Therefore, let us come boldly, come just the way you are to the throne of grace and obtain mercy. Come the way you are. Oh, pastor, you don't understand. I still smoke. I still drink alcohol. Come the way you are. Pastor, you don't understand. I lie sometimes. Come the way you are. Pastor, you don't understand. I do some things in the office on the side that are not entirely legal. Come the way you are. Your best bet of getting redemption is not hiding away from God, but coming to God and bringing your fault before him. He is the ultimate redeemer. He is the everlasting, unchanging changer. He never changes, but he specializes in changing us. Come the way you are. Come just the way you are. As a matter of fact, if you are too pure and too clean, that means Jesus did not need to die for you. Because the Bible says, while we were yet in sin, Christ died for us. So there was a reason why he had to die. That's why the Bible says, even after we have given our life to Christ, in John chapter 1, verse 9, he said that if we confess our faults, he is faithful. First John, rather. First John chapter 1. If we confess our faults, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let me tell you something, guys. This is a bonus point. God hates hypocrisy. God hates hypocrisy. He, he hates hypocrisy. The people, the Bible says God resists the proud, but he hates hypocrisy. hypocrisy. If there's anything that I'm going to, you don't get from this sermon at all, just come the way you are. Bring your blessed self like that. Yourself with your big ears and fat mouth and pot belly and, you know, and one pack. Just come the way you are. Come the way you are. Oh, pastor, you don't understand. I cheated. I, one lady said to me, I, I've given you this example many years ago. She couldn't forgive herself. This is now a lady who is 30 years old. Or 29 at the time. She'd, she'd had an abortion when she was 17 years old. And um, she since then she had become a Christian. And she just couldn't go over that hoop to the point that she married. She couldn't even conceive. There was nothing wrong with her biologically. But she couldn't forgive herself. And so we had to work on her and say, look, God has forgiven you. God has forgiven you. The Bible says the day that you came to Christ, let me give you an example. Oh, this is good. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You know, some of us that are very religious and legalistic, those of you that are uh, holiness police in the church, that you want us, all of us to, you know, let me give you this example. Remember the thief on the cross on the side of Jesus. Remember that guy? There were two, th there were two people on either side of him. 
And one of them said to him, man of God, pastor Jesus, you said that um, you're a miracle worker and you know, you know, or let's not call it pastor, pastor is a small name, Reverend Bishop Jesus. You know, you said that you're a miracle worker, you heal the sick, you do all these things. So why are you not saving yourself? And the other guy says, don't you fear God? This man, we, we are criminals, but this man did not do anything wrong. And he said, master, remember me when you come into your kingdom. In other words, I believe in you. I know you're the son of God. I know we're not going to the same destination. Remember me when you come to your kingdom. You know, what did Jesus say? He said, today, not after three days of fasting, not after two years of sanctimonious living, not after many days of attending church, especially Grace Community. Today, you will be with me in paradise. That means the only thing you need to get into rightness with God is for you to confess your faults and to believe in the Son of God. And that very minute, God, you become a qualified candidate and citizen of heaven. So let's stop with, with you know, we, 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 as I know, I know many of you pastors and leaders, you mean very well, you know, you mean well, but you know, uh, you may be sincere, but be sincerely wrong. Somebody said that to me many years ago. So let's stop trying to put hoops, the hoops that God did not put before people. Let's stop trying to put those hoops to people. He said, today, some people find it difficult to believe that today a thief will enter heaven. Let me tell you something. Jesus actually said this, that many of you will be surprised by the people that get into heaven. Some of you holy, choir singing, pew hugging, uh, tithes giving Christians, some of you may not make it to heaven. And I'm not saying that in a bad way. I'm just saying that let's get our act right. Stop the pretense. The fact that your name is Joseph or Josephine does not guarantee you're going to heaven. The fact that you were born in church, the fact that your, past, your father was a pastor, the fact that you lived in the vicarage does not guarantee you going to heaven. The Bible says that there is salvation in only one name. And when you believe on that name, you will be saved. End of story. Praise the Lord. I don't know how I got into all that. That wasn't in my notes. But I, I just needed to explain to you that there is, the salvation journey is so simple that you sometimes you need pastors, theologians, and YouTubers to confuse you. I've been watching a lot of YouTube these days. My goodness. There's a lot of stuff out there. That's why I've been pushing our media team. You know, the, one of the greatest ways to counter error is not to make noise about the error, but simply to push the truth out there. People align and recognize truth. Praise the Lord. Well, we gotta crack on, we gotta crack on. This is good stuff. I don't know if you're getting this. I, I'm, I'm, I'm loving it. So the heart of worship, God can spot a fake from far. So let's stop with the pretense, please. Confess your fault. Worship is based on a relationship. That's good, right there. Worship, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4. We need, we need to read this. Hebrews chapter 4. Remember I said we're doing this from first principles. All right? Hebrews chapter 4. My favorite version is the New King James. Um, it doesn't mean it's holier than the other ones. It just means I like it, okay? So... <laughs> Don't let somebody make a doctrine out of that. Praise the Lord. Yeah, because folks, folks like doing things. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen, amen, amen. Hebrews chapter 4. Where are we? Hebrews chapter 4. I'd just like to share my screen with you, if that's okay. Let everybody see what I'm saying. It's a bit small. I apologize. The Bible says that seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted 
as we are, yet without sin. Verse 16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, so that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I love what Pastor Rick Warren said. He says, when you see therefore in the Bible, you need to find out what it is there for. <laughs> Amen. You see, the word therefore means that because of this, as a result of this, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. As a result of what exactly? What is the reason why we have boldness? What is the reason why we have access? What is the reason why we can now come just as the way we are to the throne of grace? Why? Look at verse 14 again. Because we have a high priest who has crossed to the heavens. And this high priest is not somebody who is unempathetic. He's not somebody who does not know how, what our weaknesses are. In fact, he says that in all points, he was tempted the same way that we are. In other words, it is in believing in Jesus, it is in believing in his sacrifice, and that gives us a relationship that then enables us to be able to worship the Lord the way we ought to. Therefore, let us come boldly as a result of that relationship. I'm going to move on very quickly. Amen. So here is the thing. I was saying this on, on Friday. I need to mention this. Many people operate with God on a transactional basis. So we have a transactional type of faith. And what God wants us to do is to have a relational type of faith. What do I mean by that? Transactional faith is that I have a problem, so I run to God. God solves my problem. I go back to living my old way. The next time I have a problem, I run to God. I, 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 I pray. I attend all night services. I, I, I go to the pastor's house. I text the pastor in the middle of the night. I have a problem. And so I run to God. God, help me. No, God, do this. Man of God, pray for me. Anoint me. Pray for my towel. Pray for my handkerchief. Pray over this. Whereas what God really wants us to do is to have a relational type of faith where we have a, an ongoing standard relationship with God. That's why the Bible says in Habakkuk chapter 2, uh, uh, in, in, in Hebrews, the Bible says the just shall live by faith. The just shall have a normal, consistent, everyday walk of faith with God. God wants us to have a relational faith rather than a transactional faith. Don't come to God and say, I want this. And there's nothing wrong with asking God in prayer, but that should not be the basis for our interacting with God. I need to move on really quick. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. What does worship do? What is the effect of worship? Hallelujah. What does worship do? I promised that I was going to try and keep the time today, and I will do. What does worship do? Worship, the Bible says in Revelations 4.11, number one, it brings pleasure to God. Revelations chapter 4. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you look at the book of Revelations, thank you, Holy Spirit. Amen, amen, amen. It says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. In other words, you and I, man was created for God's pleasure. We were created to bring God praise. One translation says for your will, for your purpose, for your pleasure, for your delight. We were created for him and not vice versa. I listen to some Christians pray. I, I, I need to say, I listen to some Christians pray. And Father Lord, you know that I need this. God is not your Uber. You know, God is not your takeaway driver. You want this, I want that. You know, we have we have reduced God to that thing that happens when I need something, so I contact God. The Bible says we were created for him. Our very essence. Now, if you understand this properly, that means you will or it will come to your, your mind that everything about us, like the worship songs that we're singing, the breath in our hearts belong to him. 
the, the, the oxygen that we breathe belongs to him. So if God is asking you to give him your life, like we preach to people, it's like, it's like my children, when, especially when they were much younger. And I won't mention which one in particular. But you, you buy them chocolates, you, know, you buy them sweets or something. And then you, 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 you say, give me one of the sweets. And they, uh, one or two of them would say, no, no. Or when they were too young, they would simply hide it and not give it to you. The one in particular who always gave it to me, by the way, but let's not, let's not out them. That's how we are with God. Am I not the one that bought, is, is God not the one that created you? Is God not the one that gave you the life? That job that you have, that money that you think you have, <laughs> is it not God that put it in your hands? Hello, somebody. To give offering in church. Ah, say that, Pastor Joe. His face is always shining. We don't even know what we're doing with this, with this, our, with this our money. They, I, all those church people, I don't trust them all. Uh, see, he, he's even changing his glasses. See, people have... People have this thing that somebody's out to get your money. No. <laughs> Jesus, you know, you know, I love David in Psalm 50. The David said, the cattle on a thousand hills. God is speaking here. The cattle on a thousand hills are mine. He said, if I were hungry, I wouldn't even tell you. Because the whole world is mine. God encourages us to give for our own good. <laughs> this is meant for somebody, some skeptic out there. I was listening to a guy who, um, he's an educated young man, gentleman. And he, he came and uh, I introduced myself to him. And, and uh, we met in a social place, not church or anything, just in a professional place. And I said, I'm a pastor. I like, I like putting things out there like that. You know, it's an evangel. Oh, he said, oh, you must be raking it in. I said, what do you mean? He said, ah, all the tithes and offering must be coming to you. I said, no, it's God's money. It doesn't come to me. I don't take a salary. I've never picked up, I've never collected a, a, a dime in church. And he looked at me and goes, well, uh, you know, I find that difficult to believe, you know, that all the pastors he knows, they are thieves and robbers. I said, well, you need to go out more. And then somebody else comes to me and says, oh, Dr. Joe. So he said to me, oh, you're a doctor as well. I said, yes, I am. <laughs> then his attitude changed. Why is it that children of God, men of God, have developed such a bad reputation amongst people outside? I think it's our fault. It's our fault. We need to change that, that, that paradigm. Of course, I'm not excusing somebody you know, who wants to believe whatever they want to believe. But I'm saying that the church needs to show a better example. Praise the Lord. We need to show an, an example. We need, to, we need to show that to whom much is given, much is expected. Much more is expected from us. We need to hold ourselves to a higher standard. Amen, somebody. If everybody is stealing in your office, you should be the odd one out. If everybody is doing the wrong thing and cheating the management, you should be the odd one out. Is, is somebody hearing me? If people are dodging, coming in late, leaving early, that should not be you. Hallelujah. You should be an example. You see, the, 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 oh, I love this. The Bible says that we should serve our earthly masters as unto the Lord. So when we go to work, don't just go to work because I was discussing with one of you during the week. Don't just go to work because somebody employed you. Go to work because you know that God put you there for a reason. You are there for a reason. You might not always be there, but while you are there, are you shining the light of Jesus for those people to see? Selah, this is not part of my sermon today, but I, I just feel I need to put that out there. You know, so people have this wrong impression about money. God is not interested in your money. God is bigger than your money. God created you and your money. <laughs> There's a rich man in the Bible, you know, that, you know, he said, after he had, should we go there this morning? You know? <laughs> oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Uh, the guy who thought he was rich. Luke chapter 12, verse 19. He thought he was rich. The reason why I say that is because 
whatever money we think we have is, is, is nonsense in God's eyes. Amen? It's nothing. And let me just say this. This should encourage some of you. Please be generous givers. Why? Because the Bible says the measure with which you give, that's what God is going to return to you. You are only cheating yourself. That's nugget number two. This is off the record. Don't tell anybody. But when you don't give, you're not only, you're not only depriving the church of necessary funds to reach out, etc. But guess what? You're cheating yourself. You are robbing yourself of a bigger destiny. <laughs> because the Bible says, when God, when you give, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together. Listen, God operates based on principles. And God himself will not go against the principles of his word. He says he has exalted his word above all his name. So if you don't give, God cannot bless you. It's not even a case of God will not. It's not a case of God might not. God cannot. He cannot break his own principle to bless you if you are not a giver. You say, did he ask you for money? No, we're not asking for money. I want to, we're preaching the word so that your life can be changed, so that you can benefit from it. Stop withholding. The Bible says in Proverbs, there is he that scattereth and continues to increase. But the Bible says there is he that withholdeth more than his meat. Of course, so you need to withhold a little bit, but not more than necessary. Some of you are looking at me as if I'm quoting from the book of Hebrews. Sorry, from the book of Gideon. Hebrews is the Bible. Luke 12, 19 says, I will say to my soul, with, thou hast laid up much good. Rejoice, take it easy. And that same night, God required him of his life, and he died. So what's the point of riches? Amen. Glory to God. Let me quote that scripture that I was saying to you. Is somebody getting something this morning? Amen, amen, amen. Proverbs eleven twenty four. The Bible says that he that scattereth, 1124, there is he that scattereth and yet increaseth. But there is he that withholdeth more than is meet, more than is necessary, but tends to poverty. Go check it out in your Bible. I'll give you a few minutes to do that. There is one who scatters, the New King James says, yet increases, but one who withholds more than is right, but leads to poverty. One of the secrets of getting out of poverty is to be an extravagant giver. This is, this is free tips. Extravagant, be, be willing to give. Be generous with your giving. Why? Because when you give, when you scatter, when you, when, you, when you obey the principles of the world, listen to me, guys. There are unbelievers. I've met some of them. I met some philanthropists recently. Some of them millionaires. Some of them, you know, I met some of them. And I was amazed, my jaw dropped. They have, they have an enthusiastic uh, um, attitude of wanting to always give. And interestingly, they always have. They never lack. They simply obeyed the principles of the word and they were gaining from it. Whereas children of God, <laughs> we are not obeying the principles of what You know, there are some people that they may not obey or embrace the person of Christ, but they embrace the principles of Christ. And so they benefit from it inadvertently without realizing it. And many of us who come to church, we're praying for miracle, 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 every day, miracle. The Bible says faith without corresponding action is dead. Faith without works. Put your money where your mouth is. <laughs> I don't know why I'm talking about money this morning. Lord help me. Please, nobody should write me any email. Uh, as you can see, um, um, we're not looking for, we're not, he's not a fundraiser. But put your money where your mouth is. If you say you love God, let's see it by your actions. What are you doing for the kingdom? Don't allow past disappointment. Don't allow past mistakes to rob you of your God-given destiny. God has so much more ahead for you. There's so much more. So much more. Look, I've been there. There were times when I didn't want to come to church. 
Not because the enemy was so bad, but because of what church people had done. But you have to forgive and forget and move on. Recently, someone upset me and I, was, <laughs> I said, I sent somebody to tell them that. Look, I'm moving on. I'm moving on. If I've done anything wrong, forgive me, but I'm moving on. The reason is I've learned that all these things are, they are too trivial. I don't need anything to hinder me from getting to where God wants me to get to. Praise the Lord. So what are the effects of worship? <laughs> that was just number one. Number two, <laughs> worship takes an act of faith or worship is an act of faith in itself. And I'm, I'm going to qualify this. I need to start rounding up. A good preacher always rounds up five times. That's right. Um, <laughs> I'm only halfway through my sermon, but we need to start rounding up in the next few minutes <laughs> because we need to be honorable with our time. In Acts chapter 16, verse 25, we won't read it. The Bible tells us about a popular story of Paul and Silas, and they were in prison in jail for preaching the gospel. The Bible says at midnight, they began to worship the Lord. Hey, can you imagine yourself being put in prison for doing the right thing? Oh, I know some of you lovely Christians. You will have been phoning the pastor. Pastor, after all the tithes and offering I have been giving to the church, after all the prayer meeting, you mean your prayer was not powerful enough to stop me from entering this prison? In fact, some of you will be saying to God, ah, ah. I have been in church since when I was 16 years old. And you still couldn't deliver me from this. But that was not the attitude. The attitude was they began to worship. They began to worship. Let me tell you something about worship. Worship is an act of faith because what you're doing is you are declaring that, Lord, irrespective of my circumstances, I know you're on the throne. Hallelujah. Irrespective of my circumstances, I believe in you and I believe in your power. Worship is an act of faith in the sense that, Lord, I may not have everything figured out yet. Lord, everything, thank you, Holy Spirit. Lord, I may not have everything aligned yet. Lord, everything may not have fallen into place. Lord, my money may not have come the way I wanted it. Lord, this prayer point may not have appeared the way I wanted. But you know what? I'm going to praise you anyway, because I know you have the ability to make this thing to come to pass. Worship is a strong act of faith. Worship is saying to God, oh God, I still praise you. In the midst of my disappointment, in the midst of the storm, in the midst of my pain, in the midst of my sickness. Aha, this is for somebody here, there's a woman here. You need to worship God. I'm not saying you should, I'm saying you need to worship God. Your miracle is literally around the corner literally around the corner. I don't know who I'm speaking to this morning. You need to worship God. I'm not talking about prayer. We've prayed. Get into the place of worship. Worship will open some doors ah, ah, that your prayer may not be able to reach. Because worship is a strong act of faith. Worship is an act of faith. Worship is declaring that, Lord, irrespective of this mess, that I'm seeing in front of me. I know that you are on the throne and I know that you are in control. Praise the Lord. That's how powerful worship is. Worship is an act of warfare. Worship is used to defeat the enemy. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 17, the story of Jehoshaphat and when he was surrounded by the enemy. No time to go into it tonight, this morning. One, one thing I do want to say that worship gives us a greater revelation of who God is. Hallelujah. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 to 5. Praise the Lord. And I've said in my notes here that worship gives us a greater revelation of, of God. And it also gives us a revelation of who we are. Amen. Hallelujah. Isaiah chapter 6 from verse 1. The Bible says, In the year that King Uzziah died, 
I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. Verse 3, and one cried to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Verse 4, and the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So he said, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Listen, friends, there are some revelations that only come to you in the place of worship. Is somebody hearing me this morning? You cannot see God the way he ought to be seen until you get into that place of worship. You will not understand this God that we worship. You will just be like an outsider. You will be a stranger. You will be like somebody looking from outside in until you get into the place of worship. Isaiah said, behold, I am a man of unclean lips. What made him suddenly realize? when he began to worship God and he saw God the way God really is. Oh my goodness. There's something that changed on his inside and said, I am a man of unclean lips. I'm nobody. Let me tell you something. Anybody who suddenly becomes arrogant. The first thing that I notice, especially in my life, when times when I have been arrogant is when I've lost fellowship with God and I've no longer I'm being disconnected from a place of worship there's nobody who worships Jehovah and becomes arrogant there's no way because every time you worship God you realize that whatever gift whatever talent whatever opportunity whatever thing you have you know that it couldn't have been you you know that it couldn't have been you with your bald head and big eyes no it couldn't have been you it came from the Lord. And that's why Paul said, what have you, what do you have that you haven't received? And if you have received it, why do you boast of it? What gift, what talent, what money, what do you have that you didn't receive from God? Is it not God that gave us? There's something about worship that brings us home to realization. Our Lord, this is you. It makes us see God clearly. It makes us see ourselves clearly. You can't worship God and be arrogant. No way. Praise the Lord. It gives us a greater revelation. Worship is what causes transformation, number five. Worship causes transformation in our lives. Second Corinthians Chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. Listen to me, friends. Those of you who are single, who may be watching this, marry a man who knows how to worship or go out with a lady who knows how to worship. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Worship promotes intimacy and causes transformation. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. Let's go there as we round up, as we, come to, as we begin to round up. That was my third rounding up, right? I know. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Don't worry. The message will be available on Facebook and on YouTube for all of us to see. Amen. The Bible said, now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled faces beholding in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. As we look into the word, as we worship the Lord, as we fellowship with him, something changes. Something changes on the inside. I think it's Jeremiah or Ezekiel that said the word of God is like a hammer. If it falls on you, you have to break. Whenever I see people who are unbroken, 
A, they're not worshiping. B, they haven't allowed the word to enter into their lives. You are still on the periphery. The Bible says you should come boldly. Enter into the holy of holies. Listen, friends. Listen, friends. There are some conversations that you will get into, that you will hear when you get into a place of worship. God will begin to download some things into your life as you get into a place of worship. And here is, as I begin to round up, finally, in Luke chapter 10, the Bible says that there's an ultimatum to worship. There's an ultimatum to worship. You see, God is not begging anybody now to worship him. We, we've gotten to that point in, 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 our, in our journey. You know, in a Revelation, I think it's Revelation 21, there about, he says, let he that is evil continue to be evil. <laughs> hey, that's a strong word. Let him that still continue to steal. Why? Because the Lord is coming. There's an ultimatum. That's why I was saying, if some folks don't want to come to church, it's okay. It's okay. God told me a long time ago, anybody that rejects you, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. So don't feel too bad about it. Amen. There's an ultimatum. In Luke chapter 10, verse 40, the Bible says, he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep quiet or silent, the stones would immediately cry out. There's an ultimatum. Friends, if you and I don't worship the Lord, inanimate objects, stones, grass, trees, <laughs> will begin to cry out. Romans tells us that these things actually tell us, they show us the glory of the Lord. Romans chapter 1. I'm way out of time, so I got to quit. I got to quit. There's power in worship. There's power in worship that is beyond what simple words can explain. This is a teaching that it's not just something that you need to understand. You need to catch it. And you need to catch it by practicing it. Listen, it may not be easy initially for some of you. Practice it. Start with five minutes. Start with 15 minutes. Practice it. I believe that the Lord will help us as we do that. This morning, I don't want to leave today without giving somebody an opportunity to, to give themselves over to the Lord or to recommit their lives to the Lord. So if you're worshiping the Lord with us today and you don't have a relationship with God, you don't know who God is, I want to give you the chance the opportunity to do so as we round off our broadcast this morning. I want to pray with you. Maybe you've been hearing all this stuff about worship and you know you don't really know what it means or how it relates to you. I want to encourage you this morning that Jesus has been waiting for you. His arms are stretched out. He's, he's been waiting for you to come to him. The Bible says that nobody that comes to him and that he casts out. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. So I want you to pray with me this morning. Hallelujah. And say, Lord Jesus, I come to you today just as I am. I confess that I am a sinner. I know that I haven't always done right. But today, I want to repair my relationship with you. I want to know what it means to be able to come boldly to the throne of grace. Forgive me of my sins. Help me, Lord, to see you the way you really are. Make me to be a child of God. Thank you, Lord, for receiving me. I am now a child of God. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And if you pray that prayer this morning, I would really love to hear from you. I'd love to hear your testimony. I'd love to read about it. You can contact us on WhatsApp. You can send us a message on the website. But do get in touch. 
And remember, we're here every Sunday, by the grace of God, by the quarter past 11. And we trust that this message has been a blessing to your life. Have a blessed week and keep safe. God bless you. Amen.